Farmers Weekly, the long-running British farming magazine here in the UK, recently published an online piece called Eight Reasons Why Becoming Vegan is the Wrong Choice. So I thought we'd go through the article, go through each of the eight points and debunk them. So let's get into the article now and we'll start with point one, which is mutuality. Man has always lived in a mutually beneficial relationship with animals. It's a contract. We provide for them they provide for us. But the problem with that statement is that contracts are mutually agreed upon by both parties. How about this guy right here? Both of them signed the contract knowing exactly what both of them are getting into. They keep telling me, moles won't eat your crops, moles won't eat your crops. But the animals have never consented to what it is that we inflict upon them. And they say if, if your crops are getting eaten, it's voles, not moles. And just because you provide them food and water does not mean that it's mutually beneficial because Ultimately, you're exploiting them and will take their life from them. Now, I've got a trick. I killed that little guy. But let me show you what he's doing to my spinach over here. Let's use that way of thinking and apply it to a different scenario. Let's say that someone goes to a shelter and they rescue a dog. This dog's going to be euthanized. So they rescue a dog who's going to be killed otherwise. The other thing you can do is get like a rat terrier because I heard rat terriers actually like to hunt gophers. They bring the dog home. The dog lives a happy and long life, 10, 12 years in the family and is loved like a family member. Got a special secret ingredient in how I killed that mole. Now that's a mutually beneficial relationship because the dog gets love and happiness in the home and the people that are looking after them get the joy of having a dog. Tried traps. I'm not having much luck with traps. I tried the poison worms and I think the poisonous worms work. They're a you know, I buy them on Amazon. I think they work pretty well. well. Let's use that same example, but change it slightly. And let's say that someone breeds dogs into existence and they breed those dogs and the dogs they breed into existence, they then mutilate. And then after six months, they send them to a slaughterhouse to have their throat cut so they can sell their bodies for money. Yeah, this right here is supposed to be the sweet ticket to killing moles. And I've got one so far. So Nothing about what farmers do to animals is altruistic. And I really want to dismantle this idea that farmers care for their animals beyond the absolute fundamental necessities required to keep them alive so they can continuously profit from them. Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week, we follow Gerwin Jones down to Wiltshire on crop protection duties, helping the farmer against the hordes of wood pigeon. Point one continues by saying, someone who cares deeply for an animal and then puts it in the food chain for our benefit is not a monster. Well, firstly, it's not for our benefit because consuming animal products causes our leading diseases and illnesses. According to a recent study published in the journal Obesity, high fructose corn syrup and soda has much more fructose than is advertised. But more importantly than that, do you not see the irony in the sentence where you talk about caring deeply for animals, you refer to them as being an it. I think I killed like 40 squirrels in one week trying to protect this baby tomato plant and I still lost most of my tomatoes. That is such a damning indictment of how people within the farming industry view animals. They refer to them as an it because they see them as commodities and objects. The farmers instructed Aidan and Stuart to stop the pigeons reared in a freshly cut rape field. Oh. Inanimate objects and beings they can profit off in any way that they so choose to. They don't view them as individuals with personalities. His squadrons in this case are the guys from Jack Pike. And the evil invaders are pigeons, both homebred and recently migrated from France, that are threatening to devastate crops in this part of the southeast of England. Animals are of course a someone. They're sentient. They're not an it. And you using that word illustrates perfectly how little regard you actually do have for these non-human animals. Collard is fed up. He's asked local authorities for permission to shoot the crows. After all, his is not the only farm being plagued by the birds. Moving on to point two, which is dependency. The survival of huge numbers of people in the world depends on animals for food, clothing, fuel and transport. Using the word huge here as a quantifier is meaningless, right? Because there are huge numbers of people in the world that don't require animal products. In fact, the majority of the world doesn't need animal products to survive. Vegan couple's son dies of malnutrition on diet of just fruits and vegetables. Point two continues by saying, their economies and cultures are based on it. We are not superior to them. What's more, importing their commodities gives us a lifestyle that is a luxury by their standard and is not defensible. The first thing to address in this is, when have we ever claimed that we're superior to other people? So I've been in this movement for over 12 years. I've seen people come and go. I've heard every excuse there is. That's such a ridiculous argument. I actually cannot believe that you've said that. You shouldn't have the choice 
You should be forced to be vegan. You should absolutely be forced to be vegan. And what you're doing is creating a false dichotomy where you're saying, well, if you're vegan, you obviously think you're superior to other people. We cannot wait for you to fucking get your shit together. We cannot wait. The animals cannot wait. So you better not be vegan to prove that you're not superior. But it's also possible to be vegan and not think you're superior. You're just gonna step the fuck up or you really don't deserve to live on this planet. In fact, being vegan is saying that my life is not superior to other people's lives. For me, vegan version of me causes more well-being and reduces suffering than non-vegan version of me. So I can say, at least in regards to that, I'm definitely a better person. I am morally superior to the- It's saying that the reasons that I can find to exploit animals are not worth more than the animal's life. Appetizing asparagus, lovely lettuces. Greens are good for you, but not if the rabbits are getting there first. This evening, Kai is on veg watch on a new piece of ground. He hopes it'll deliver a few bunnies and woodies for the pot while reducing the number of magpies, crows and squirrels which are running amok. But the reason you do what you do to animals is because you think that you're superior to them. Today on the show, I'm back at one of the missions, which is uh, a nursery for plants, shrubs uh, and trees. And it's in the uh, East Midlands area. And there's a problem on this permission with rabbits. And just a little point about the importation of commodities, because this is so ironic. And I just want to read this quote out from the National Farmers Union. The landowner has given me permission to come back on here again uh, and try and thin out some of the rabbits and also the pigeons and, if possible, some magpies. The quote says the UK's successful livestock industry relies on imports of feed, including genetically modified, which actually is often illegal for human consumption. So a lot of the feed that we're importing to feed to livestock animals, we wouldn't be able to eat ourselves. Many shoppers are aware of the international food chains which bring them fruits and vegetables out of season, but perhaps are not aware of the feed chain behind their meat, eggs and dairy. And so by your own logic, the industry that you're protecting and supporting with this article is also not defensible because as the National Farmers Union states, it relies on the importation of commodities. We are 100% grass fed, so the cattle that you see in the background here spend their entire life out here on the pasture. Point three is sustainability, which says, our consumption of the world's resources and our environmental footprint are massive compared to the people I've been talking about. Unless we really live off the grid, everything we do contributes. Well, this is just an appeal to futility then. The growers must clear a high bar to achieve success. The fruit has to be perfect. If it doesn't look pretty sitting on the supermarket shelf, they're not gonna purchase it. Which puts them at odds with these little guys. Because why bother trying to do anything to improve the environment? Let's just all shop with as many plastic bags as we possibly can. Let's all just keep fracking, let's keep deforesting and destroying the natural world because unless we live off the grids, then what's the point in even trying? Cousins of grasshoppers called katydids, which do a lot of damage to crops. To kill katydids, many growers turn to a class of potent insecticides called organophosphates. If that's the best argument you have against going vegan for sustainability reasons, that really is a damning indictment of the credibility of the arguments that you're using. The most widely used is chlorpyrifos, manufactured by Dow DuPont. But for the same reason organophosphates are very good at killing katydids, they are harmful to humans. Point three ends with this little gem here that we've heard so many times before. Eating soya instead of meat doesn't change that quite the opposite. Now this drives me mad, right? How many times do we have to address this issue? And today I'm going to be demonstrating how to make delicious soy protein burgers by hand. 97% according to this report here of soy that's produced in the Amazon is for animals in the livestock industry. Today the popularity of soy foods is booming, especially among vegetarians. Globally, that's about 85% of the entire supply chain, according to a group called Soyatech. So in fact, the problems related to soy farming, are not because of vegans, is because we produce so much soy to feed to the animals that we then kill and eat ourselves. Now it's time to drive demand for US soy to where it's never been before. The United Soybean Board's long range strategic plan is the roadmap to do just that. A step-by-step -step action plan to drive preference for US soy around the world. In fact, in the UK, we import about 3.2 million tons of soya every single year, the majority of which comes from the Amazon to feed the animals in this country. 3.2 million tons every single year. Soy is in everything. 
from cereals to canned tuna to shampoo. Even in products that don't show soy in its ingredients label, you'll find it under aliases such as textured vegetable protein or lecithin. In fact, soybeans are added to around 60% of the nation's processed foods. And so we go into a supermarket and we buy bacon or chicken. It comes with a British label on it. It says support British farmers. Yet we cook it and we eat it. And what we don't realize is that we're consuming that meat with a little bit of the rainforest as well. Soybean oil may account for approximately 60% of all oils consumed and 7% of total calorie consumption in the US. Crazy. And if we take vegan companies, for example, a brand like Typhoon that produce tofu products, the soy that they use is non-GM organic soy from Europe. He says European buyers are realizing the supply of non-GMO beans is drying up all over the world. They used to get some out of Brazil. Brazil's at 95% GMO now. Argentina's, I think, 100%. We're at about 95%. So the EU is starting to come back to the U.S. for beans and meal. It goes on to say, how can it be wrong to eat something produced where we can see it, it again, raised on grass, water, and sunshine? and right to eat something highly processed and flavored made from imported products. Well, the first thing to address here is that the criteria for determining whether or not the action is moral is not whether or not these animals are outside and get to feel the sunshine and get to graze on grass. The determining factors and the morality of these industries is that these animals are sentient beings. And today we got another exciting episode for you, and this one's not a fun one. This one's having to do with pests, pests in your garden. See that little sucker? Look at what that little sucker's doing. There's a little bird, he's eating my tree collard seeds, little scumbag. They can feel, they can suffer, they have families, they deserve autonomy. And the reasons that we have for exploiting them are considerably lower in importance than the life of these animals. If wool damage to berry bushes persists even after maintaining short or no grass between rows and around the perimeter of the field, then the last resort is to apply rodenticides. Because of course, that's why what we do to animals is immoral. It's not to do with the way that we keep them. Using welfare to try and justify something fundamentally goes against the notion of animal rights, which is dismantling the industries that exploit their bodies regardless of what form that exploitation takes. Once you have bought your rodenticide, the next step is to figure out where to apply it in your field. And if we apply that argument, the argument that is, it's morally justifiable to harm an animal if they're outside and have food and water, then it therefore must be morally justifiable to hunt lions. Because when a rodent is poisoned, it takes up to three weeks to die, making it easy prey for predators. The predators then die from secondary poisoning. Because of course they're outside and they have food and water. So why then would it not be morally justifiable to shoot a lion if they too meet this criteria? The increasing use of rodenticides to kill mice is leading to an increase in secondary poisoning in mountain lion populations. And the final point of section four is, do we even know where these products come from, their carbon footprint, or how good for us they are? And I presume that with this point, you're talking about Beyond Meat, which is interesting because there was a life cycle analysis conducted by the University of Michigan. Jennifer Washburn looks at the relationship between corporate America and higher education in her new book, University Inc. Which compared the environmental impact of the Beyond Burger to a quarter pounder made from cows. The Beyond Meat Burger uses 99% less water. If you're a crab or a fish or a baby shrimp caught in the dead zone, you die. The problem starts thousands of miles away. When fertilizer gets applied to farmland, 93% less land, 46% less energy, and produces 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Especially children. So our kids continue to be exposed by virtue of living near agricultural spraying. It also contains no cholesterol, no trans fat, no antibiotics, no hormones. And so yes, it is better for the environment and it is better for us. And we do know that. Eskenazi found pregnant women with signs of organophosphates in their urine, gave birth earlier, had children with diminished IQs and more. Attention problems when the kid was school age lower IQ in middle school age, poor executive function a little bit later. Point five is health, which starts with what we eat now isn't unhealthy. 
We just eat too much and we don't eat a balanced diet. Meat is part of a balanced diet, as is fish and dairy. Now, firstly, these products are unhealthy for us. It doesn't matter how much we consume them, they're still unhealthy for us because they're objectively bad for us. Let's take smoking as an example. You can smoke one cigarette and it's not gonna kill you, but it doesn't mean that smoking one cigarette is healthy for you and it doesn't fit into a balanced, healthy lifestyle, regardless of how many cigarettes you do smoke. They're being exposed every day to a witch's brew of toxins. These chemicals were invented during the Second World War as a nerve gas by the Nazis to use against people. And it was only after the war it was realized that these chemicals that would kill people can also kill insects. And also this balanced diet fallacy is just so nonsensical because the American Dietetic Association, which is the largest dietetic association in the world, is formed of over 100,000 credentialed professionals in this industry. Has this video will discuss the Academy, a corrupt organization on a quest for as much money and power as humanly possible. Has this to say about a plant-based diet, that it is the position of the American Dietetic Association that appropriately planned vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthy, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegetarian diets, including vegan diets, are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, and for athletes. I'm so today I'm going to be talking about the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic Association. The problems that the ADA, which is what they call them for short, stem from the fact that they receive funding from some of the biggest processed food and nutritional product corporations. And a further point about the balanced diet idea, which always confuses me, is, is it not just so coincidental and fortuitous that the animal products required for a balanced diet just so happen to be the animal products that we farm where we live? Here are some of those companies. Hershey's Corporation, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, ConAgra Foods, Abbott Nutritionals, General Mills, Kellogg's, Mars Inc., Soyjoy, Corot Wise, Unilever, Monsanto Corporation, McDonald's, NutraSuite, makers of aspartame, National Association of Margarine Manufacturers, and Nabisco. Isn't that just a stroke of good fortune that we don't need shark fin soup for a balanced diet or a steak from a blue whale or dog meat? We just need the animals that we conventionally farm. Does that not seem awfully coincidental to you? They instead serve as a vehicle for the benefit of their corporate sponsors, each one thriving off of the suffering of an entire nation. Instead of competing against each other like in the traditional free market, food and drug companies collude to maximize their profits at the expense of their consumers. The Academy was going about their corrupt practices largely unscathed until 2009, when Senator Chuck Grassley wanted to dig deeper into how the organization operated. Number six is individualism. We think we're standing up for ourselves and the planet, but we're being taken for a ride. Supermarkets, advertisers, fitness gurus, trendy restaurants, and cookery book writers love what we are doing. We're the new market, and they will take every penny we have as for helping the environment, dot, dot, dot. So yeah, that's right. Ignore all of the research that's coming from the University of Oxford, from Cambridge, from Harvard, from Yale, from Cornell, from the United Nations, from the WHO. Ignore all of that. And therefore, the WHO is an agency I'm interested in. Now I join you to achieve an even more important vision, which is good health for every human being. How does the WHO decide on its recommendations? And how reliable are they? What I have found out is shocking and far exceeds my initial suspicions. What is worrying is that a small group of companies have attempted to subvert the process by which WHO is run. Point seven is conservation. The countryside we love is not maintained by people with mowers and shears, it is grazed by animals. It goes on to say, we couldn't grow anything but grass on two thirds of it. Why not take a free resource and use it to feed people and store carbon? Is this not the whole reason why we find ourselves in the situation that we have found ourselves as a society, that we view the world as a free resource? Fertilizer pollution causes problems even before it gets to the ocean. It can contaminate drinking water or turn into suffocating smog. And it's a big contributor to global warming. We should look at an area of land and go, wow, Look at the area of land, it's got its own natural ecosystem, it's biodiversity, and humans haven't touched it or done anything negative to it. But instead, your industry goes, oh look, there's a free resource over there, I can make money from that land. 
That's why we're in this situation. You know, last Friday when USDA revealed the June acreage report, we saw corn acres uh, reported at 91.7 uh, million acres. That was well above the average pre-report estimate. Because we won't let the world just be the world and exist naturally. We see an area of land that's not been harmed by humans and we view it as a free resource. But it's also left our food vulnerable to extensive attack by pests. In turn, we've become more dependent on pesticides. Today, we annually shower over 5 billion pounds of pesticides across the earth. How do you not see the irony again in the section about conservation calling areas of land a free resource? Look at the potential health risks from pesticides in our food. Nearly 70% of conventionally grown produce sold in the U.S. was found to have pesticide residue, according to a new report from the Environmental Working Group. As we told you yesterday, strawberries, spinach, and kale top their so-called dirty dozen list of produce with the most pesticide contamination. And we'll move on to the storing carbon point when we get on to point eight, but let's just finish point seven quickly. Why not take a free resource and use it to feed people and store carbon while looking after the landscapes, habitats, and species we value so much? Well, isn't this really ironic? Because there was a State of Nature report that said that out of 215 countries around the world, the UK ranks 189th for the intactness of our biodiversity. When a rat eats a rodenticide, it takes up to three weeks to kill the rat. This gives opportunities to predators to eat the rat and be subjected to secondary poisoning. Secondary poisoning greatly weakens the mountain lion's immune system and can lead to increased risk of automobile collisions and diseases such as mange. Since the 1970s, we've seen a huge decline in wildlife species in this country. In fact, 60% is the average across all the species. And as it currently stands, 50% of all birds and 25% of all mammals are endangered. Does that sound like protecting the species that we value so much? We're in a farm in North Staffordshire that's been complaining of nuisance rabbits for some time now. And who better to clear a few bunnies than Nathan Whitehead and Pete Malkin? Now let's move on to the final point, which is soil. Now that we've seen the results of years of large-scale arable cropping, majority of which is for animal farming, of course. The f American food system has now become built on two grains, corn and soybean. Be the American supermarket typically has something like 40,000 different products in it. And you think, you walk into a supermarket, you're like, wow, what a great diversity of stuff. Really, it's all different formulations of these two grains. We want to get animals back on the land. It's not just about grass. The soil under animals' hooves benefits hugely from all those microprocesses involved in grazing, treading, and recycling of nutrients that billions of flora and fauna depend on. Livestock are life. Now, it's really important to address this point because this is something that the livestock industry are constantly talking about, the regenerative agriculture myth. The idea that it's good to graze animals on these lands because we can store carbon in the soil from doing so, and it's good for the natural flora and fauna. Now, Dow Chemical wants to ramp up the use of 2,4-D, a component of Agent Orange, on the food we eat. Hmm. Do we really want Dow Chemical producing the food we eat? Now, there's a big problem with this, which is that there's a study that was released called Grazed and Confused. It was a two-year study of an international team of researchers from all around the world. <laughs> looked at 300 different sources and it looked into the claims being made by livestock farmers that grazing animals was good for sequestering carbon into the soil. 50% of the U.S.'s agricultural products come out of California. It's something like 85% of the country's lettuce comes out of Salinas, 90% of the almonds. It's called a salad bowl of America. California uses more pesticides than any other state. The second biggest is Florida. Things like chlorpicrin is used out here on the strawberries. Chlorpicrin is a nerve gas. And what they found out through two years of international research, 300 different sources, is that actually when you look at the amount of carbon that can be sequestered, at best, it offsets about 20 to 60 percent of the total emissions from these grazed animals. Last month we did soil tests on our operation and what we found is that we've over tripled 
the amount of organic matter, in other words, the amount of carbon stored in our soils. Which means that actually we're still creating a huge surplus by grazing these animals in the first place. In 1993, we could only infiltrate one half inch of rainfall per hour. Now we can infiltrate over eight inches of rainfall per hour. Think of the ramifications of that. I tell people it's not how much moisture and rainfall you get, it's how much can your soils hold. Because carbon-rich soils hold on to water, they help the ranchers weather droughts. And actually, ultimately, what happens in the soil is it reaches something called soil carbon equilibrium, which is where the amount of carbon being sequestered is equally matched by the amount of carbon being released. And at that point, we're not offsetting any of the emissions from grazing animals. And so if we want to reduce the emissions in the world, the best thing that we can do is take the animals off the land and restore it with natural biodiversity, which will sequester carbon even better than if we're grazing animals on there in the first place. At the time of European settlement, about two thirds of the state, some 20, 25 million acres of the state, was tall grass prairie. We have less than one one hundredth of one percent of the native prairie that's still intact. It's a mute point. It doesn't make any sense, and it's something we have to get through and dismantle because it's a fallacy that's so dangerous, because it's claiming that grazing animals can be beneficial for the environment, but it simply can't be. And there's no scientific evidence, no credible scientific literature that says anything different. Results produced by grazing that regenerates the soil, equal parts art and science, with a splash of history. Our prairie soils were formed by large herds of bison, elk, they would move, they would graze an area and keep moving. And they might not return to that area for a year, maybe two years. To mimic this herd migration, they break up their ranches into small areas called paddocks. Now let's just also address the idea of land because the writer's saying that we want to get more animals on the land. Okay, so in the UK, for example, we kill one billion land animals every single year. Now about 980 million of those land animals, they're raised entirely inside. So let's say now, that we want to raise all of those one billion animals outside. How are we going to possibly do that? Remember, like I said before, half of the UK landmass is already dedicated to animal farming, and now we want to put 980 million more animals out into the landscapes of the UK. It's just doesn't make sense. And that's besides the point as well, because chickens and pigs can't survive solely on grass anyway. So they'll always be fed arable crops. Um, we have two groups of pigs that are both in the same pen right now, uh, and they have never tasted grain. There is simply no way for us to consume the animal products that we do, but also do so in a way that subscribes to what this journalist is saying. It's just not possible. And if we really cared about the soil, if we cared about conservation, if we cared about society in general, then we would realize that we have to dismantle animal farming. The pesticide accident, our top story tonight. State agricultural investigators say it was the worst case of pesticide poisoning of farm workers ever in our state. 77 people have been treated so far for exposure. One after another, these farm workers fell ill. They all came here to the Ruskin Medical Center. Because simply, that's the best thing that we can do to meet all of the criteria mentioned in this list. But actually, he goes on, because there's a final paragraph here. If we feel better for being vegan, fine. But we're not saving the world, we have no right to preach, and no justification for doing atrocious things to people who have just proved their worth to us in this crisis. Firstly, I don't know what atrocious things would be. What's atrocious is sending someone to a slaughterhouse to have their throat cut for money. That's atrocious. Five million pounds are applied every year. It's used on dozens and dozens of crops. On some, it's used on more than half of the crop in this country. That's true of apples, for example. It makes the nerve system go haywire. And it causes things like, you know, terrible, terrible headaches and nausea and vomiting, all the way sometimes to paralysis and, and sometimes even death. But more to the point, I don't think they've proved their worth to us in this crisis. I actually think they've done the opposite. Because what this crisis has revealed to us is how terrible our agricultural system is. The available acreage for agricultural use must be treated more intensively to achieve greater yields. But intensive farming depletes the soil. For this reason, the soil must be fertilized. This means that fertilizer must be produced. Synthetic ammonia is needed for this. However, 
Producing fertilizer based on ammonia or phosphates is a complex process. It poses a wide range of challenges. 1. Fertilizer production requires large amounts of gas. How in a time where we became temporarily fearful about the food supply, we actually were able to reflect on how inefficient our agricultural system actually is. And is a modern plant producing different types of nitrogen fertilizers. The plant, with its own port, covers 135 hectares. How many resources we squander on creating products that aren't even beneficial for us to begin with. And actually, if we want to create more food and increase the sufficiency and sustainability of that food, then we should shift to a plant-based agricultural system. I mean, today, I think it's about 75% of, of agrochemicals are sold by four global companies. And increasingly, actually, they have also bought up all the seed industry. So, you know, they control the supply of seeds and they supply, control the use of chemicals and they have been completely dictating the direction that agriculture has gone in, which is really more about their profits than it is about producing healthy food or maintaining farmers' incomes. That's also not mentioning the fact that it was consuming animal products that created this pandemic. And when we are successful, and we will be, the plant-based food system isn't going to create a viral pandemic either, so that's an important thing to mention. You told your superiors, the men in charge of the swine flu immunization program, about the possibility of neurological disorders. Absolutely. What would you say if I told you that your superiors say that you never told them about the possibility of neurological complications? That's nonsense. I can't believe that they would say that they did not know that there were neurological illnesses associated with influenza vaccination. That simply is not true. We did know that. But ultimately, what this pandemic has shown to us is how quickly and urgently we need to change the agricultural system. And that change has to be taking out the animal products, incorporating more plant-based products, and ultimately restoring the landscapes that we've completely destroyed for needless, needless reason. This forces us to dig deeper into the situation where the nefarious schemes of the organization become more apparent. Thanks to the internet, we were able to find the inquiry and we'll post a link to it in the description below. The Academy shows the companies that funded them in the years prior, including pharmaceutical companies like Takeda and food companies such as Soyjoy, a subsidiary of Pharmavite, a supplement company. This is interesting because of their statement on vegan and vegetarian diets, which we covered in our last video, claiming that these diets are healthy and safe for all ages with proper supplementation. Is it any wonder why they would take hundreds of thousands of dollars from a company that produces vegetarian protein bars, baby formula, and vitamin supplements, and then turn around and recommend that people become vegetarian and supplement? You'd have to be a sheep to believe that that is a coincidence.